My name is Becky Larson. I'm an assistant professor and extension specialist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, I'm going to talk today about manure irrigation and some of the research we've been doing with pathogens. Uh, I will say this is done with a whole team. Um, a lot of people, the unfortunate thing is they send sometimes me to do the presentations and I am not a microbiologist, so please bear with me and if I slip up and say anything totally incorrectly, I'm sure there's enough microbiologists out there to, to chime in and let us know, but um, I am not a microbiologist, I'll, I'm definitely an engineer. I think Mark does not struggle as much with engineering stuff as I do with microbiologists, with microbiology, whatever that says about us, but uh, we have a, a large team that worked on this. Um, it was a pretty uh, intensive project with a lot of sampling. And I'm going to share with today with you a, a, a variety of the different things that we worked on. It's really hard to boil this down to 20 minutes with all of the, the things that we've done. Um, but I'm going to do my best to do that. Um, and uh, there will be a place where you can look at all the results uh, without my take on it. Okay, so manure irrigation and pathogen transport um, is, is a pretty specific thing to study. You might ask, why are we doing that? But if you drove around Wisconsin, you might see these um, uh, big signs that are up all over. Um, we have started, not that manure irrigation is new in Wisconsin. We've had it around for a long time, and it's by no means illegal in the state, or uh, regulated, I shouldn't say illegal. Um, although it's starting to become, some areas are starting to put uh, bans on some things. And you can see uh, the concerns of many um, that we see out there, lots of concerns about the, the human health impacts of manure irrigation. I will say that um, when I initially started this, I was surprised to see this because we, we don't really have a lot of, uh, we haven't seen any outbreaks or so we think related to health issues with this type of application. Um, but, I, you know, as we work through it, I do realize a lot of people are nervous, they, and there isn't a lot of data, and there are real concerns, and people are very nervous living next to some of these uh, facilities, and, you know, lots of questions about if my uncle has cancer and lives, you know, half a mile from this, what's happening, and I say, I, I don't know any of that, uh, but we did try to look at some of the things related to this to at least gain some more information to provide uh, the the, the public in Wisconsin with what might be happening around their homes. Okay, so there's kind of two pieces to this research or group altogether. One is that we have a work group that we put together through the University uh, of Wisconsin Extension, and that's led by Dr. Ken Genskow, and um, we have 18 members on that work group, and we go through a whole host of things related to manure irrigation, so it's not just pathogens. Um, it's looking at all the benefits and concerns and all the potential impacts uh, on water quality, air quality, drift, etc. Uh, we do have a website, so feel free to go there and you can look at every uh, thing that we do in more detail. Uh, every time I give a presentation, this date changes, so or we can never get anything done on time. And some of the results I'll show you today, I went over as many times as I could with Mark to get the wording right, um, but we're kind of in a, uh, a, a quick jaunt to try to get everything done from what we um, analyzed in the field in the past few years. So um, we're trying to get our report out sometime this spring, hopefully by summer, um, and, and you'll be able to see all the details there. What I am saying today is only my opinion, not the work group's opinion. Uh, you, <laughs> you will see how everybody votes, and I know some people definitely disagree with me about some things. Um, so in that report, it'll mark anybody who doesn't agree with what the findings and recommendations of the group are and, and why that might be. Okay, uh, so why are people interested in manure irrigation? Um, we've seen uh, the potential to reduce hauling costs. I think you know a lot of producers we're talking to are talking around half a cent to apply with manure irrigation. And I would say if that's our, if you have irrigation systems already installed, uh, we don't see a lot of people just putting in irrigation systems for this. You know, a, a irrigation line underneath the ground will run you over 125, 150 thousand dollars a mile. So with the cost of other things by itself, an irrigation system for manure doesn't seem to pencil out in my head, uh, but we do see a lot of people who may be using it on certain crops to irrigate and then also having this uh, additional application with it um, can be uh, cost saving. Uh, we have a lot of road traffic issues. Um, so when you can pump the manure, obviously 
um, it, we have an advantage as to saving some of the issues related to that. Although there are many at manure application methods, of course, many of you know that rely on pumping that you don't need to use irrigation. I think the biggest benefits that we see that producers are really interested in is multiple crop applications, and people think that has the potential to limit uh, water quality issues related to groundwater concerns and surface water concerns, um, and some reduced soil compaction. And we see a lot of smaller producers um, that have storage using this type of technology when they're concerned their storage is going to overtop uh, in years where we have difficulty. So you think, well, applying to a wet field when you can't apply anyway isn't great, but it's probably better than letting your storage overtop. So um, also maybe water quantity issues. Uh, if we can use manure instead of pumping groundwater, there may be some benefits to that. Uh, what comes along with that is a whole bunch of challenges, uh, including odor, which I say all the time, manure irrigation would be the last thing I picked if you had odor concerns. Um, drift, uh, there's concerns with, you know, lots of people have expressed, well, what if I have an organic farm right next to there, and maybe manure you consider organic, but I don't. So there's lots of concerns about actual, like, wetted particle drift that's been a, I don't know why that's been such an interesting thing to define for people. Um, again, concerns about water quality. If I apply highly liquid manure, uh, am I going to increase runoff? Um, air quality, operational issues, um, but the biggest one being health concerns. So initially when we started doing the research, it was only, it was on a really wide variety of pathogens because Mark originally was more interested in impacts to potential herd health issues, but we've now kind of limited that to human health because this kind of blew up so big, and, and I'm sure many of you might well just know the costs related to doing uh, some of these studies, so um, we're, we're, we've really limited that to human health. But one of the problems we've had is there's little data on any of this. So almost everything that we've taken into our report, we've tried to cite as much literature as we can, and you can look at all the information we talked about in the tables and our recommendations for design and all kinds of things. Um, but none of it, almost none of it, is done actually on manure irrigation systems. Uh, so just so you have an idea of the systems we're talking about, uh, traveling gun, we, we focus on two, traveling gun and center pivots. There are other irrigation systems, but they're not very common in Wisconsin. Uh, so you can see this traveling gun system. We originally thought these were mostly just used by smaller pr producers, which isn't tracked, but we have also found a lot of larger producers are using these systems as well. As well. We've even seen somebody across the country kind of adapted one of these to have a linear kind of pivot design off of it, which is interesting. Uh, here's our center pivot systems. You can see um, this is after the center pivot system has passed by. You can see kind of this is a nice diagram where you can see the wetted perimeter uh, of while we're applying manure. We see a lot of people apply the manure diluted, so they'll use diluted applications, uh, straight manure, all kinds of different ratios that the there. Uh, it's most, com uh, most common now as we're moving to drop nozzles. I can pretty strongly say that that'll be something that will be required moving forward for anybody to use. Um, again, if you're familiar with these systems, these drop nozzles come in all kinds of different packages and shapes and pressures and produce different droplet sizes and you can change tons of characteristics. You can even buy uh, 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 equipment that can control each nozzle individually. So there's a lot of technology advancements that you can use for these types of systems. Uh, coming out of the systems, most of the manure that comes out of these systems requires some processing to remove solids. Um, out of the traveling gun, we're talking, you might even go up to 4 or 5% solids. Out of the center pivots, you're, you're most likely going to be uh, below 3% solids coming out of these systems. Uh, this is the end gun. You can see this has been a source of controversy, particularly because in Wisconsin we've had incidents with people on a bike path, and, <laughs> and it's still lovely. It's really hard to, to, to not see their side of the point there. But we have even had lots of concerns with people's houses getting sprayed, and even using this nearby, people have said, my house has become so inundated with the smell, I can't remove it. And we've seen producers even purchase a house from some people that have had problems, but then we see the person buy a house right on another field, so it's, it's very hard to tell what, what is really the issues. But lots of concerns for some of the end, uh, end gun use as well. Okay, so for the research, um, we did field measurements, so we actually took field measurements. It was interesting, we worked with um, someone from John Hopkins who uses samplers for much cleaner environments, and she was like, what are you doing uh, using these out in the field? 
um, but we tested a variety of different samplers um, and ended up using um, Anderson samplers and then some little button samplers. Um, and so what we did is for many different trials, we put these samplers out in the field at different distances away from the irrigation units. Um, and we put a weather station in, and we upwind and tried to measure wind direction and speed, air temperature, uh, solar radiation, relative humidity. You can imagine this was really difficult, right? We don't have any university farms that have irrigation systems, so we had to use producers and time that and drive there, and we'd get set up, and then the wind would change direction. And so it, 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 is, it was much more complicated than maybe I ever imagined it being. Um, so you can kind of see this is an idea if so we had the if we had the traveling gun we would pull it by where the samplers we had upwind samplers and then we had downwind samplers at different distances away and we tried to duplicate as many as we could so that we had some additional information um, we we also sampled the incoming manure uh, so that we could test for if a pathogen existed or not uh, before we test for it in the air sample because it didn't seem to make a lot of sense to waste all that money uh, Mark will always tell me this is some of the cleanest manure we've ever seen, so that is one constraint to put on it. Um, uh, so we did, we did at the farms that we saw, we actually saw that we, we didn't see the concentrations we maybe expected or saw in other sampling times. So for our trials, um, we used a total of three farms. It was very difficult to get a farm to allow us to come on to measure pathogen transport off the farm, as you might be able to imagine. Um, but eventually we had quite a few volunteer, but we actually... For this range of trials, we only sampled from three of those. Um, of the data, we have eight center usable eight center pivot trials, 15 traveling gun trials. Um, Mark did two tanker trials. He did a few at night, um, which was even harder to get the DNR to let us to do. Um, so we, we grabbed a variety of data. Um, and, and we tried really hard to try to get different weather conditions, but I said that's very difficult. But in the end, we did better than what than I thought we would. So you can see the tests are kind of marked with dots of the temperature range that we saw, the range of relative humidity and wind speed. This was the one big thing we were trying to vary quite a bit. The problem was near the end of the testing, the DNR started saying past 10 miles an hour, we didn't want to see, so it's tough to get some higher wind speeds then. Um, and then we have, when we say, what was the average wind speed as compared to gusts? It's all a little complicated, but we try to put all of that in there so you can see the details. Okay, now we're getting to the part where I hope I don't screw anything up. Okay, um, so here are all of the microorganisms that we commonly measured. There were, we started with a much bigger list, but then that kind of got cut down. And some, we do have some samples for some other things. But one of the things we did uh, measure all the time was bovine bacterioides, even though that's not a pathogen. It's a nice indicator. It's always present in dairy manure, so it was very helpful for us to use, um, particularly for our models you'll see in a little bit. Um, you can see... Uh, what percent we detected some things, and then um, how many trials they were measured for. So uh, a lot of the things, like, you know, salmonella, we never saw it, and Mark found that weird. Uh, some of these that we are clean manure didn't really have it around. Okay, um, so after we collected all the data, uh, Mark used that information to put uh, into uh, a QMRA. So he took the data, he put it, made a statistical model, used that, uh, used a pool of individual, took random draws, uh, used inhalation rates and inhalation volumes, made a lot of assumptions, all of which you can detail and I can provide you more details in. But of course, with this study, there are a lot of assumptions, but we have tried to clearly define what all of those are. Um, and then you can look at, all right, so if I inhaled this many pathogens, um, what is your dose, and then did a ton of iterations, right? So in my head, this makes sense as saying, here's how much pathogen was there, a person breathed in this amount, dose-response relationship, this is how many people get sick, run a lot of iterations. So uh, that's, that's the way I make sense of it in my head, but I know it, it might be a little more complicated than that. Okay, so here's some of the assumptions. Um, one uh, for E. coli 015H7 used a prevalence of 38.5%. We didn't see it in our trials, but um, he used that particular concentration uh, or, or that particular preven prevalence at this concentration. Um, uh, he imagined it was aerosolized like bovine bacterioides, and it had survival characteristics the same as that. Now, these are a lot of big assumptions. 
one of the things that Mark pushes a lot is that bovine bacteriorities is maybe more resistant, so this will be a conservative estimate um, of what we see. So some of the results, um, so this is going to typically what you see for a few slides, they'll be one paired with another. Um, the blue line is our median risk. Um, this dotted dash fat dash line is what we put as the drinking water acceptable risk by the EPA, and that is what our work group kind of discussed as where we thought we would set a limit. Um, but we also added the recreational water acceptable risk here, um, just so you can get an idea of. Uh, we don't know what we're going to use yet. Or, and actually, Mark just says the data is our job. It's someone higher pay grade to decide what is acceptable and what is not. And I probably will have no part in that discussion. Um, <laughs> so you can see there are some, some times in that occurrence when um, the risk was a little bit higher. So you could see the upper quartile risk. But for, for the medium risk here, uh, we're pretty low for you know 60% of them are around zero. So. Again, this is using bovine bacteroides, right? It was always present. That was a more what we thought of maybe a more accurate model. Um, and this is at 500 feet. So this is when we ran the assumptions for at 500 feet away from an irrigation system. Um, this, um, so this is so here's now risk as a function of distance. So that was for 500 feet. So now you can kind of get the idea. Here's the acceptable risk. Here's where for drinking water, here's where our median risk lies. And as distance increases, again, we have a reduce of that upper quartile. Okay. So um, this is the data. I don't know how it's going to be used yet or what people are thinking. Again, I would push that this is very conservative. Um, OK, so now this is a worst case scenario. So if instead of that 38.5% prevalence, uh, we imagine it's at 100%, prevalence from 500, you can see and make sense that the risk um, becomes much higher. Um, this is at that worst case scenario, 100% prevalence. And again, here is now our median risk in the blue and green as a function of distance. So there's a lot of ways this data can be interpreted. Um, and I would say that, you know, what we see, this is worst case scenario for this particular one. And we've only, Mark has only gone through E. coli 015H7, and he plans to do it not on uh, some of the other uh, pathogens that we studied um, as a substitute and as well as developing their own model and not using bovine bacteroides, but we're, we're not quite to that stage yet. Um, so again, here is if instead of using um, bovine bacteroides, we use cultural gram-negative microorganisms. Um, and you can see, again, median in our, now our upper quartile risk is below that, um, uh, the drinking water acceptable risk. Okay, I have one minute. Um, and then just the same as before, you can see how that plays out differently. And none of the, the, the what is the other risk level? Um, none of the, oh, recreational water risks are on these graphs because they're so much higher up there. So you can see this can be interpreted in a lot of ways, right? Our current setback is at 500 feet in Wisconsin, and we'll have to decide if we feel that this, which one we think is most representative, and then what our recommendation will be from there. And that's still in our work group discussion plan right now. So uh, some of the takeaways, these are conservative. Um, again, bovine bacteria is a surrogate. Um, and it exhibits high resistance to environmental inactivation. Um, sometimes, we, so we did do qPCR and cultural, or I will say Mark did. Um, a lot of times in these analysis, we use the qPCR, and it, this overestimates. Um, and then again, that worst case scenario, we assume it to be 100% uh, uh, prevalence, 100% of the time. Um, dose response model derived from outbreak data likely represents the most uh, virulent pathogen strains in the most vulnerable health population. <coughs> okay, so um, the one thing I want to say, in addition to this, I know I'm almost a minute over, is now we're still refining to, instead of using a statistical model, um, uh, a d air transport dispersion model, and so we're doing additional work. You can see we've begun to model some of our things, but now we're using a wind tunnel 
a giant one if it works, to be able to refine some of the parameters that we don't think that we're taking estimates from other work, not from manure irrigation, and be able to incorporate those so that we can more accurately use the model to predict different scenarios. Because what we're seeing in Wisconsin is a lot of producers are saying, well, what if I put in a digester and this and this and this, that's different than if somebody does it. So we want to try to use wind speed and initial concentration. Some of the other things we know play some kind of importance from our statistical analysis and be able to model some of those and then input that into the, the QM. Uh, thank you very much, and if you have any questions, this is a one time I got covered. Okay. It's just a very quick comment. Sure. Uh, when you talk about the worst case scenarios, you have to be very careful because eventually those are going to become your standards. Sure. So just you know, be careful. Yes, we've been very big on making sure anytime our slides are used or out there, and with the report, we're trying to include the range and make sure it includes enough information, but it's a very good point. The other question, as a veterinarian, you know, E. coli 0157H7 is not an inhalation pathogen. It's not a respiratory pathogen, and so it's not pathogenic inhalation. It's only pathogenic under oral exposure. Right. And so Using I'm that particular one might not make one, sense. One, because it is a very public sensationally, it's very public sensitized organism. Sure. But even if you were exposed to that through inhalation, it's highly unlikely you have enough oral ingestion to hit your ID50. So I'm wondering if that doesn't muddy the waters more than the meat. I'm assuming Mark probably factored in the ingestion, the 50% or 10% ingestion. I, I'm sure he did. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask Mark, and I have a, a knowing Mark, I'm sure he would I mean, think of that did. because he's very uh, anal. Yes, there you go. Uh, in a good way, in a good way, but I will make sure that that is something represented there. And make okay, sure I think that we're going to have to move on. Sorry. Excellent, excellent talk.